Good ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ryan Suda. I'm one of the senior investment managers here at ShareWise. And we're here with Managing Director and CEO of Bump and Gold Holdings, Alexander Scanlon. Now, Alexander's been kind enough this afternoon to lend us his time and expertise regarding Bump and Gold. He's going to start things off uh, with a presentation, just introducing us to the company and seeing how things are tracking at the moment regarding their ongoing projects. And then we're going to open up the floor to a Q&A. So, as usual, I've got a couple of questions that I'll ask Alexander to kick things off, and then we'll pass it over to questions on the floor. So, if any participants have questions they'd like me to ask Alexander, please submit them through using the Q&A function on Zoom, and I'll ask them off the presentation. But again, Alexander, thank you very much for your time, and the floor's all yours. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I will share my screen here and just bring up our latest corporate presentation. And uh, we will use that as a talking basis. I'm going to just bring this up the full screen here. All right, Ryan, can you see that? Sure. Perfect. Great. So just before we get into the presentation, uh, this image on the front here is pretty useful. This is a photo of our open pit perseverance mine. So this was a high grade open pit, as you can see, is quite shallow. Uh, that was dug around some historical high grade underground mines in South Australia. So this is an interesting sort of central feature of, of some of our sort of near-term and long-term strategy, which we'll come back to as we go through the presentation. Uh, a couple of important notices here. I assume everybody can read all this very, very quickly. Um, and look, getting into the, the high level, for those of you who are not familiar with Barton Gould, uh, whether specifically or generally, uh, in a very general sense, Barton Gold is a pure play gold developer focused on South Australia. So we have taken an interest in the state uh, due to a very long history of gold uh, exploration and production uh, in the central Gala Creighton, but one that has been very, very sporadic, right? So not, not very large scale, not very continuous. We were very interested in South Australia looking around uh, the country several years ago because as a state, South Australia has a very significant gold endowment really actually is very quite underrepresented from a production standpoint. So South Australia has about 25% of Australia's known gold resources, but speaks for only about 2.5% of annual production. And there are a number of reasons for this, but one of them is that uh, as a state, South Australia has really been focused on copper and uranium development for the past 30 years. Uh, and the other is predominantly the fact that uh, sort of as a matter of perfect storm, Right as this copper and uranium investment uh, investment was taking place, uh, what was a very excited market for gold in South Australia, South Australia essentially had a, a second, second gold rush in 1996. With the gold price declining in the late 1990s, investment interest fell away in gold generally. And then when the gold price came back in the late 2000s, people didn't really come back to South Australia in the way that they went back to Western Australia and Queensland. So we saw that as an opportunity to pick up proven geology in a in a globally renowned district is the central Gala Creighton where we are. Uh, we are next to mines like Carapatina, Olympic Dam, and Prominent Hill. Um, but this is ground that really sort of left in the 1990s, as a matter of speaking. So our strategy was to consolidate the uh, significant historical assets in the region, advance them through significant investment in understanding regional geology, and then bring it all back into operations in sort of a staged lower cost and lower risk standpoint for strategy that would allow us to leverage existing infrastructure and then slowly build over time. So we've taken a long-term strategy first, um, focused on basically establishing both open pit mineralization and then looking at complementary high-grade mineralization that we can use to blend into that large-scale long-term project as well as leverage our existing mill. So this is something we've been doing rather methodically during the past several months uh, and years. Uh, we've had four resource upgrades during the past uh, 18 months. And we've also just released now quite a large uh, scoping study demonstrating that our Tonkilia project can produce about 130,000 ounces per annum at a very competitive $1,900 per ounce all in sustaining cost. So we've got a lot of momentum going and we're really, really well funded to continue during the next sort of uh, 12 to 18 months as we go through optimization and hopefully additional exploration, discovery, and development of these resources. Looking at our capital structure, uh, Barton's got a pretty clean capital structure. We have about 219 million shares on issue, which today makes us about a $50 million company. We have about $10 million in cash. So our enterprise value is around $40 million Australian. 
okay, which we think is pretty attractive considering the you know, rather large amount of installed infrastructure that we have, um, and also the success that we've demonstrated in terms of identifying resources and growing them. So one of the key things for us that's really important is this uh, consistent methodical advancement of what we are doing, uh, and then being able to actually sort of take that step by step through a development regimen. So that includes uh, a series of exploration, uh, exploration discoveries, a series of resource conversions, and then stepping that now into studies. And what we've seen is that Barton has started to break away from and significantly outperform both the general gold market as well as the sort of market for other explorers and developers through this consistent outperformance and through attracting a number of specialist resource investors that basically have seen the progress we're making in what has been generally a difficult market for gold investment generally, uh, and have really built into and consolidated our register. So when you look at our ownership, you see we've got about 20% board and management ownership, which is really important. So we are aligned with all investors. We have another quarter of the company owned by specialist gold investors. We have another quarter of the company owned by high net wealth investors. Uh, and then we have about a quarter of the company owned by retail. Uh, looking at capital structure, uh, we have built a team that has got quite a bit of experience both in gold and in South Australia developing significant operations. So uh, this team is, is, is not your traditional exploration team, but it's really much more a forward-looking team. Uh, we've uh, got probably somewhere around 250 to 300 years of experience exploring for uh, permitting, financing, developing, and operating uh, major resource assets in Australia again, with a particularly strong pedigree in both gold and South Australia. Uh, we've recently had some really important hires to our team as we move forward into sort of a commercialization phase. Uh, Nicola Fraser has joined us as our CFO, formerly of uh, Normandy and Newmont Mining, Beach Energy as well. Uh, Kim Russell has also just joined us as our development general manager. We have an exploration team that has got a great deal of experience exploring for and developing assets in the state. And then our board of directors as well as a diverse body of experience in terms of leading really significant multi-billion dollar uh, oil and gas and mining uh, operations, including through the development of multiple mills. So uh, this is a team that is really geared towards this long-term strategy. And that strategy is to build a 150,000 ounce per annum producer, leveraging the assets that we have today and the infrastructure that we have today to develop this all in a staged lower cost and lower risk strategy. So again, going back to that strategy that we were talking about, uh, looking at sort of large scale assets, where we're really focused is on bulk open pitable mineralization. And so we are looking at our Tarkula and our Tunkili assets. Uh, these are the assets you can see here in sort of the bottom half of our map. Uh, these are two assets that are about 70 or 80 kilometers apart. So they're sort of satellites to one another, but they have different geology. They're very complementary in a respect or in a matter of speaking, Conchilia is this very large continuous shear zone where we have now built up a 1.5 million ounce resource. So we sort of tick the box on that and build a large scale long-term strategy uh, sort of platform. And now we are drilling at the neighboring Tarkula project to look at some complementary high-grade mineralization that we can use to not only blend into Tunkilia longer term and enhance the over econo overall economics there, but also take that third point of our, our strategy to realization, which is to say, if we have some shallow high-grade mineralization at Tarkula on an existing mining lease, uh, we can put that through our existing fully permitted central Gawler mill and start a stage one operation, produce 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 ounces, generate this cash flow for a couple of years while we're advancing Tunkelia towards permitting and development, and then essentially scale up into Tunkelia and by doing this, we sort of create this staged lower cost, lower risk development model where we're sort of able to self-fund or partially self-fund as opposed to having to go all the way from zero to 150,000 ounces per annum all at once. So it's it's really, this is why we talk about this staged lower cost strategy uh, because we can leverage existing infrastructure to go to operations instead of having to build entirely new infrastructure to get there in the first place. Uh, our focus on this front and the reason we're really aiming at bulk open pit mineralization with Tonkilia as the long-term basis is that it really does work better than anything everywhere else. 
you know, bulk open pit mining is where you can get volumetric efficiencies of both capital and operating costs. And we model what we're trying to do at Tonkilia after a company called Capricorn Metals. So Capricorn is a company that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's also an Australian listed company. Uh, about a $2 billion, probably about $2.2 billion today, uh, gold producer. Um, and way back in uh, 2015, they bought an asset called Carla Winda. Uh, and they were doing a lot of work on this as we were evaluating the Tonkelia project. <clears throat> and they bought the Carla Winda project as a uh, 650,000 ounce asset. They grew to 900,000 ounces and 1.1 and 1.3 and 1.5 million ounces. And then they focused on developing it as a bulk open pit, bulk processing operation. And you sort of fast forward another five or six years, and they have now grown the Carla Winda project to a 2.2 million ounce resource base at an average grade of about 0 0.7 gram per ton, which is something that conventionally people would think of as a low grade project. But that today is actually one of the lowest cost gold producers in Australia. So they process about four to 5 million ton per annum at, uh, at a grade of uh, 0 0.9 gram per ton or so in terms of their current head grade. And they're producing about 120,000 ounces per annum. So it's really instructive about sort of the, the value of operating at sort of, or, or sort of, I should say, obtaining capital efficiencies of scale. And what you can see is we've really pursued that sort of uh, scaling and development methodology. We acquired this project five years later, uh, sort of our timeline is laid underneath their timeline. Uh, we acquired Tonkilia at the beginning of 2020 as a 550,000 ounce asset. We grew it. Uh, to uh, 965,000 ounces. We found five new gold zones and we've grown it to 1.1 and 1.3 and 1.5 million ounces. And we've now taken it into scoping studies, very much following that same efficiencies of scale methodology. So we think this is the pathway to success. Uh, we've been taking steps consistently, methodically moving in that direction. Uh, and we've now had some really good initial results from Tonkilia. So when we look at Tonkilia itself, the map here on the right-hand side of the screen shows the footprint of what we're dealing with. And when we acquired the asset, what we acquired was this sort of darker colored uh, area here uh, around the main 223 deposit. Uh, again, that was a, a shallow drilled uh, two kilometer long deposit. We drilled in the center of the deposit uh, on, the, on the view that there was probably a higher grade zone in the middle there, which we validated. We drilled and extended its depth a couple of times, and we found multiple new gold zones along strike, which we've now confirmed our new Jork resources. And we've done this all relatively quickly. This has all happened over the span of about three years, and we've done it very cost effectively. So that the cost per new ounce uh, acquired or discovered is around $15 Australian per ounce on an all-in basis. So not just the drilling cost, but the assaying and field labor and logistics and all of these things. Um, it's very, very cost efficient. It's about 20% of the Australian average cost of discovery. So that's been a really good return on investment for us. And we've now moved to test, okay, how does this mineralization react to being dug and processed at scale? Uh, and what kind of platform does that give us for further optimization and growth? We are also looking, when we think about growth, not only in expanding the existing mine plant, but discovery along another 20 kilometers of, of shear, which have been broadly untested. So there's a lot of ways for us to look at optimizing this. But one of the sort of key things to look at is the sort of the nature of the geology uh, here and what, what got us interested in this and why we think this is interesting uh, and what specifically we were testing in the scoping study. And what you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen is sort of the main body of mineralization in 3D. And the right-hand side is a cross-section through the middle of that. And what you can see is this is sort of very broad, highly continuous mineralization. We limit our resource modeling to 300 meters depth. We're really much more interested in finding more bodies of mineralization along long strike than going too deep at this point. But when we look at the cross-section that we have here, and this is a cross-section through the middle. There's sort of three, three key characteristics there. One is that about 80% of the tons and ounces are within 200 meters of surface. So we have a slight bias to shallow, if you will, in terms of the economics. The second is that in the center of the deposit there, we have a 300 meter long higher grade zone. And you can see this in the sort of orange and red colors in this cross-section on the right-hand side of your screen. 
So what this means is as we start or have a starter pit here, we have a zone of higher grade mineralization, which lifts the average grade and really forms an ideal starter pit for us. And then as we look at the, along sort of the length of the deposit, you see this light blue sequence on the left, and that is essentially this T zone that you see in the image on the right. So as we open the pit to the north and to the south to get ready for bulk mining operations, we have this super gene sequence. So this is softer mineralization. It's got about a quarter of a million ounces. And what this means is our pre-strip is paying us instead of us having to sort of constantly capitalize all of this additional pre-strip without revenue. So it's very attractive. And when we throw this all through a model, uh, what we get is an initial test to say, okay, using some conservative assumptions, what do we get if we turn this on on the basis of a 5 million ton per annum plant? How efficiently can this operate? Uh, and then what are the opportunities to sort of pull some levers and optimize things to bring costs down even further and extend the mine life? And we have a very good initial set of numbers. Um, so we, again, tested this as a 5 million ton per annum project, and what it's given us is a 130,000 ounce per annum gold mine. Uh, so it's producing 130,000 ounces per annum of gold. We have a byproduct credit of around 300,000 ounces per annum of silver, which is nice. Um, and importantly, uh, what this is doing is we've taken this, again, a 50 million ton resource. We've put some initial figures, or very conservative figures around operating and processing costs. And it's given us a first sort of six and a half year operation. But importantly, it's producing gold at 1,900 Australian dollars per ounce, which context would put us um, entering the bottom one third of Australian gold producers today in operation. So uh, again, I think we would rank number 17 of 47 uh, production, uh, sorry, gold operations in production today if this was operating at those numbers. So this is what drives, even though it's only an initial six-year test, this is what drives such a strong payback period of 1.9 years and also a very strong uh, unlevered IRR of 40%. So now what we're looking to do is to say, take this baseline test and say, where can we optimize uh, our assumptions around the capital operating costs to extend and grab more of this resource into the model? and further basically enhance and extend the, uh, the, 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 I should say the mining plan and therefore boost further the economics. So when we look at that, one of the things that we're looking for is uh, one reduction of operating cost so that we can extend and smoothen uh, the pit profile. So if you look at the staged mine design that we have here, naturally you have a pit, you're gonna dig it in stages, uh, we've used some really uh, conservative assumptions around the hardness of this material, which I'll discuss uh, in the subsequent slides. But basically, when you have your, your processing costs, that then tells you how much money you have left for mining to then uh, optimize your mine plan and, and operate at a certain uh, sort of cutoff grade of mineralization, as well as targeting a profitability per ounce. And so what we've got is a stage mine design where we see a lot of opportunity, and you can kind of discern this on the on the right hand side of this page, we see a lot of opportunity to actually uh, expand and smooth the pit design, and therefore bring additional mineralization into the mining operation. But also, by smoothing that pit design, you actually optimize both capital and operating costs. So it's kind of an iterative process here. But what we want to do is expand that, bring that mineralization in and therefore sort of create a virtuous cycle of optimization that way. And one of the other things that we're looking to do in our neighboring Tarkula gold field is also to identify supplementary or complementary higher grade mineralization. As the reason for this uh, is that, uh, and what, what reason for this is that we can see the effect or the benefit of just marginally higher mineralization in what we call our stage one starter pit. So, Recalling that we have that central higher grade zone there, uh, we have modeled a starter pit around that. And that's that pit outline you see in yellow on the cross section there. And then on the bar chart below, the areas in yellow are the gold ounces and the feed produced by that yellow area. And we've put a little table in comparing this, but essentially for an already competitively uh, competitive production cost of $1,874 per ounce on a life of mine basis, that starter pit 
<clears throat> with a grade that is 1.26 instead of 0.93 is able to produce an ounce of gold for 1,235 Australian dollars. So very, very competitive. That would make us one of the lowest cost gold producers for a short period of time in Australia. And that really illustrates the benefit, uh, the benefit of being able to optimize that feed to slightly higher grade and put that through a very efficient bulk mill like the 5 million ton per annum plant we are planning. So that is the sort of two key areas that we are focusing on there. And when we think about bringing down the, the operating cost to be able to allocate capital into a mining, ex mining expense and therefore expand the mine plan, we're really looking at optimizing the assumptions around comminution. So crushing and grinding this material. When you're looking at the processing cost, it's basically down to comminution, crushing and grinding, and the power required to do that, because obviously crushing and grinding rock is very, very, very power intensive. And that's really your primary cost. In fact, 50% of the processing cost is just power consumption. So we have taken some very conservative assumptions about the hardness of material, how it's crushed, and therefore how much energy would be, would be required to do that. And now as we look at optimizing the study, we're going to have a take a closer look at it, basically taking a more realistic and slightly less conservative view of that, uh, model this by domain and work out how much le less power do we actually need because we've essentially just assumed the very worst possible number we could take based on all of historical test work. So a lot of opportunity there. We can bring down the uh, hardness and the comminution cost. We bring down the power cost. We bring down the capital cost and we can potentially significantly extend the mine life. The long-term upside, and where we're trying to go with this, is not only to turn the existing footprint into an eight to 10 year operation, but to look beyond that. So everything that we've looked at now with Sunkelia is inside the green box on your screen here. And we've got another sort of 20 kilometers or so of untested major shear zone strike along to the north and the south of that mineralization. So we do think Tonkilia has the potential to host multiple of these types of large scale, lower grade bodies of mineralization. And we want to go and find those, of course. And then thinking about Tarkula, the neighboring project at the north, <clears throat> if you have a series of large scale bulk open pits feeding a bulk efficient operation, like a 5 million ton per annum plant, you would love to have some higher grade gold nearby. And that is where we look at Tarkula. So again, stepping 70 kilometers to the left. Tarkula was the home of high-grade gold in South Australia. So uh, this is really the home of the first major gold discovery in South Australia in 1893, uh, right on our mining lease. So this is where some of the old-timers came and found outcropping mineralization during the same year as West Australia's uh, main gold rush around Kalgoorlie. And way back in the 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, quite a few people were out there mining artisanally, pulling gold out at 30, 40, and 50 gram per ton uh, from shallow outcropping veins on a hillside uh, where our mining lease is. Fast forward 100 years, uh, a mining lease was put in place, and a small open pit was opened around some of those historical mines. And that's the open pit you saw on the cover of the presentation. That was producing about, uh, sorry, that produced 30 or 35,000 ounces during a two-year period of time with that mineralization going in bulk at three to four gram per ton to our central gallery mill. So we have an existing mining lease with proven mineralization, proven logistics, proven metallurgy, and a fully licensed mill. So naturally what we wanna do is see if we can add some additional ounces to that pit floor and see if we can find more of these things because they are very, very, very valuable. One, to blend into Tonkilia for the long-term, but two, to start processing an earlier stage operation with an existing mill that we do not need to build and permit. So when we look at the mine itself, uh, this is a long section of that open pit you see on the cover. Uh, and what you can see from this is actually is quite a shallow uh, mine. And you can see this on the cover as well. Uh, but what we've done is we've drilled through the pit floor and we've modeled here in orange and uh, yellow and red, about 20,000 ounces of mineralization in the pit floor. And we have a bunch of other mineralization we've modeled uh, here in gray that is not classified for drug purposes. So we've done some more follow-up drilling here. What we're looking to do is add a few more ounces in this pit. Uh, we do not need to have a million ounces to start this operation or our existing mill because we don't need to pay for the mill. 
So what we're looking to do is really create a pathway of two or three years of operations or two or three years of feed for this mill to turn it all on. So even putting 30 or 40,000 ounces in this pit floor, that could be one to one and a half years of mill feed for us and make a very attractive uh, short, uh, short term or shorter term stage one operation. That also is very useful to understand why we're so interested in this mineralization because we've got 20,000 ounces in the pit floor there. We think we can add more. But that little small area there uh, between you know, the bottom of the pit floor and this guy produced around 35,000 ounces in a contemporary setting. And then this area produced about 75,000 ounces uh, historically just from shallow you know, mining of veins. So there's a lot of mineral wealth in relatively short, uh, short, uh, short distances and, and shallow depths in this area. So what we're looking to do is to try to find more of these. And what we have done to that effect is while we've been building up Tonkilia and sort of building up this 1.5 million ounce resource space uh, at Tarkula, we've been busy mapping what we think is the sort of architecture of the sort of the underground features that have essentially fed that historical gold field. And so this image here is a complex image, but this is essentially a structural image. Imagine, if you will, if you took a giant fire hose and washed away all the dirt covering all the structures around this area. This is about a 15 kilometer long model showing all of the known historical gold occurrences in the Tarkula gold field. And what we can now see, what we can now model uh, with all of the work that we've done is a system or series of structures that are analogous to the one that created that high grade mine. Um, and we can see all of the known historical gold occurrences here in a consistent structural framework for the first time in a 130 year history. So this is a pretty exciting, essentially advanced starting point for going to see, can we find more of these high grade open pits, potentially create a series of these, feed a stage one operation and then blend into the expansion to a stage two operation. So a uh, lot of opportunity here. We've just done about 10,000 meters of drilling and we're hoping that we find another one of these things uh, in the course of the next year. Uh, so we have been very, very busy. Um, you know, one one thing about us is, is true is that, uh, you know, we're not sitting at our hands, uh, just waiting for a better market. Uh, we are very good at creating money internally. So we generated about $10 million in additional free cash since we've IPO'd. That's given us a lot of additional capital to go and do exploration work, even in a difficult market. We've had a number of resource upgrades. We we process and sell gold on an ad hoc basis. Um, we are constantly monetizing our existing assets. Uh, and we're expecting to have more resource upgrades this year. And of course, we're aiming to have a material optimized scoping study as well yeah. as we go into 2025 and look toward future development of these operations. So in summary for us, you know, we have a pretty unique platform. Uh, we're growing it very, very quickly and consistently on a cost efficient basis, and we are very well capitalized to continue doing so. So it's something that obviously we think that we have a, a pretty compelling opportunity, but it's really a combination of a strong platform and consistent performance that we think is going to lead us to success on a large scale 150,000 ounce per annum production basis. So very happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you very much for the presentation, Alexander. Found it um, very informative. Now we'll just move on to a couple of questions I've got and then we'll open up to the floor. So if any participants have any questions, please do submit them through the Q&A function on Zoom and I'll ask away. Now just to kick things off, obviously Tarkula uh, seems to be a really interesting opportunity in combination with the uh, existing uh, brawler metal. Realistically, what's the potential for growth of the open pit resources and other sources of mineralization within that area? Yeah, look, um, I mean, the, the potential is, is pretty significant. So um, if we look at the regional map here, obviously we can see all these gold stars here. Um, all of these gold stars are historical gold occurrences. And there's about 600 of them. Yeah. And this is really a, a function of just essentially shallow historical prospecting. Uh, the open pit itself, um, again, this is a sort of short, complex geology. So we don't, you know, we're not aiming for this pit to have, you know, a couple hundred thousand ounces on it. What we want is to find another, you know, 30 or 40,000 ounces that can very easily from an existing open pit right from the pit floor go through our mill. The potential to find repeats of these, we believe, is quite significant. So again, what, what we're aiming to do during the next year or two is to basically say, in this immediate area here, what's the potential to feed the existing mill? 
And then around this whole area, the potential really uh, for longer term, large scale mineralization is also quite significant. We have a number of major shear zones. These could feed longer term uh, mineralization into our existing mill and also blending into our future Tonkelly mill. No, thank you for that clarification there. Now, obviously, you know, it does appear when you just break it down uh, to a simple granular level on your books that you've done a lot of work over the past three years with a relatively small amount of capital. Um, I, you know, I'm just fascinated to see how you guys have been able to do this when obviously compared to a bunch of other, uh, you know, smaller mock crap miners that haven't been able to do the same. And realistically, whether you can kind of maintain um, these operating cost levels. Uh, I think, you know, a couple of different uh, things that are pretty important. One is that we always do make sure that the majority of our money is going into exploration. Um, obviously, you've got to have money to spend to be able to say the majority of your capital is going into exploration. One of the really important things I've touched upon is that we do generate some capital internally. So uh, we IPO'd three years ago uh, for, we raised about $15 million on the ASX. Uh, since that time, we've only done two pretty small placements to uh, specialist gold investors who requested that we open, uh, I guess, open a raise and and, and allow them to, to build into the, the position. Um, we, during that time, have also generated about $10 million in cash from asset monetization. So this is disposing of, of, of equipment uh, that to us is junk, but valuable to somebody else in, in so many words. It's also actually disposing of junk. So we sell scrap materials. Uh, we have cleaned out uh, and uh, cleaned out our gold mill and prepared about six million dollars or seven million dollars worth of gold and concentrates, which we have sold and are still selling. Uh, so this gives us a lot of additional capital to to do all this work. But we're also very careful about how we spend it. So we spend a lot of time thinking about where we're going to spend our money. Yeah. We, uh, we explore on a very cost efficient basis on say on a per meter drill basis. Uh, and we tend to think about how we aim before we drill and, and therefore have a bit, uh, well, thus far a pretty strong success rate. So it's all these things have come together to be very efficient for us. Okay, okay, it's a much more tidy approach. Now obviously on the subject of asset monetization, realistically over the next kind of calendar year, are there more opportunities available? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. And obviously, one of the ones we're, we're sort of aiming for is to monetize the existing mill by uh, by mining an existing open pit. <laughs> but if we think about between now and then, uh, we do have a whole number of opportunities that we're, we're looking at. Uh, one, we have existing historical stockpiles that we're looking at. So these are both low and some higher grade stockpiles. We might be able to pull uh, additional mineralization out of. Uh, we have uh, additional surplus plants and equipment uh, that was from an historical underground operation that we don't require. And then we're also very active in working with the state and federal government uh, to look at subsidy and grant programs. So, uh, you know, we are actually quite grateful to, to South Australian and federal governments. Uh, we're probably the beneficiary of, of north of $3 million worth of uh, grant funding. So uh, we're sort of always actively pursuing these different things. And I would expect that we will continue to benefit from these uh, which of course is is a net benefit to our shareholders. Of course, of course, and, and obviously in the short term, is there potential for you guys to ascertain more grant funding, or is that going to be longer term? Um, when, you know, when there are further projects up and running. Uh, certainly, we we look, we we are a regular beneficiary of of R and D uh, funding programs and other exploration grant funding programs. Uh, so that's everything from working with the University of Queensland on some uh, some interesting uh, exploration work that we're doing, uh, the South Australia's Accelerated Discovery Initiative, uh, the Australian Federal Government's ATO uh, R&D uh, Tax Refund Initiative. Yep. So these are things that sort of fit in the regular ongoing workflow. Uh, but then also looking at our development pathways, you know, we're quite interested to look at what are ways that we can lead development regionally and not just for our own benefit but other people around us in a way that the state and federal governments can get behind and hopefully bring in some additional support that way so larger dollar things that are focused on infrastructure energy power these sorts of things okay all right we appreciate the update on that front just to focus now on the time killer uh, do you believe you can extend the life of the mine based on the existing resources you guys have currently presented uh, we do, yes. Yeah. So again, uh, looking at the high level, which I've just brought, uh, brought back up on the screen, 
again, what this has given us as, as an initial test is a 6.4 year mine life. And again, to, to think about it, if you have uh, a, if you have a fixed assumption about your revenue per ounce and you uh, do a mine plan optimization uh, to say, how much can I produce? You basically need to say, what are my, what are my model revenues and what are my model costs? And so if you have processing costs and mining costs as your two main cost base bases, and you've taken really conservative processing cost assumptions, as you dial those back and make them more realistic, you essentially release more money to go into your mining costs. And that allows you to expand your mine plan. So we wanted to be conservative and come in in terms of saying, you know, how efficiently can we can we make gold here? Uh, but we also want to be conservative about how long we could make gold. So as we pull back costs and as we figure out how to optimize both capital and operating side of things, we would expect to be able to extend further into the existing resource uh, and, and be able to harvest, if, if you will, more of it. So we we're currently have about 60% of the resource in this sort of model mine plan. We would expect to be able to extend that more towards 65 or 70%. Yeah. Okay. And obviously, on the note of being conservative, realistically, how conservative have you been when it comes to estimating process costs? And realistically, when it comes to you know later optimizations down the track, with the assumptions mm -hmm. in mind, do you have the ability to potentially lower capital and existing existing operating costs? Yeah. So again, I'll go back to the the, the sort of key opportunities slide here. <clears throat> if we look at the two charts on this slide, uh, these are our process operating costs by area. So by sort of the the, the key different areas of, of of let's say cost consumption. And then the bottom slide is the the input cost by actual specific cost. And what you can see is essentially if you had to say what is your biggest uh, cost center, it is the combination of grinding and the power required essentially to grind. So that really comes down to how hard is the material and how do you crush it? Now, we have assumed single stage crushing, uh, only crushing rocks to basically making sure everything is less than 15 centimeters or 150 millimeters. So these are rather large pieces of rock that then go into a large mill. We've also assumed uh, that the material all has a bond work index of about 25 or 26. Now, this was a, a number we chose, again, to be conservative, which was uh, of all the historical test work we had, we had everything, things ranging from, say, 15 up to 25, uh, 25 being very, very hard. And 25 was essentially part of a bit of a mafic dike that gets mined, but it's not actually a target body material. But we took the essentially the worst, highest hardness number and said, we assume that everything has this hardness. Yeah. So if everything does not have that hardness, if it's in fact softer, then your crushing power consumption, your grinding power consumption is going to be a lot less. Turn that into your 75 micron material, your 80 micron material for processing. So there are a lot of ways that we think we can actually materially bring back the operating costs. What you can see here is that uh, if grinding is 60% of your cost, power is 50% of the cost by, by actual input. Uh, if we could reduce the hardness by 20%, we might be able to reduce our power cost by 5 to 10%. And that would have a profound impact on the operating costs. It also means that the capital costs could come back considerably because uh, the throughput rate of a mill is determined by how much has got to be, you know, be in that mill and the residence time that it takes to go through it. So if it's really, really hard material and it has to go in there and stay in there for a very, very long time, the mill has to be very, very, very big to be able to get 5 million ton per annum through it. But if the material is softer, you can scale down the mill and that brings down your capital costs as well. Of course. Thank you for the clarification on that one as well as the update. I'm sure shareholders are going to appreciate that. Well, that wraps up my question. So we'll just shift over to statistical questions here. We have, obviously, the first one here being, obviously, you've noted that you have 10 million currently sitting on the books. With the current uh, cash burn rate in mind, how long, realistically, will the 10 mil last? Oh, look, we're pretty aggressive in terms of our exploration. So, you know, we could make that last three to four years if we were doing a little bit of work, but we we're, we expect to spend that money over the next 12 to 18 months. 
Yeah. Um, we also expect to bring in additional uh, sources of capital during that time in the form of grants and asset sales to, to further subsidize that. So we're in a very good position uh, to, to play for a, a pretty long period of time with the capital that we have. All right, thank you for that update there. Now, when it comes to timelines of immenseless actions to achieve the first goal pool, realistically, mm -hmm. um, how long are, um, you know, what, what sort of time horizons are we working with? Oh, well, look, I think it's always tricky to, to answer that yeah. type of a question, but I think we tend to look at things from sort of the back to the front again, thinking about uh, hitting the sort of the long-term strategy versus uh, sort of backfilling to the short term. When we look at Tunkilia, you know, this is a, a four-year pathway to go through all of the uh, studies and approvals and permitting and financing and construction to have this turned on. But what we want to do there is look at bringing forward a couple of years our stage one restart. So in a perfect world, we would be restarting our existing mill sometime in 2026, looking at sort of a smaller scale feed going through that and make that transition from explorer into producer, generate cash flow, and then develop Tunkelia. So the idea hopefully is during 2024 20, and 2025, we can map out that pathway. And during 2026, we can make that transition. Well, Mark is going to appreciate that one. Now, just a couple of ones we've had submitted today. Uh, Twist of notes is that I note that the, resources appear, uh, the resource appears to be significantly achieved by lowering the cutoff grade. Has this been based on increasing spot gold prices? Uh, no, so we haven't lowered our cutoff grade. Um, um, not quite sure where the, um, if, if, I'm, if I'm answering that correctly, but uh, for the bulk open pit mineralization, we use a 0 0.4 gram cutoff grade, which is a, an e common economic cutoff grade for bulk oven pit. On the area 51 component of our Tonkelia mineralization, if I go back to the map here, uh, area 51 being the smaller pit to the northwest here, we've used a slightly higher cutoff grade of 0 0.5 gram. The reason being it's slightly more conservative because it doesn't have the benefit of being a three kilometer long bulk open pit like area 223. Uh, but the cutoff grade modeling is a function of the geostatistics and uh, economics. And so that 0 0.4 gram cutoff grade for open pit resource modeling is pretty consistent. Uh, it is consistent with what, with what we've done for the past three or four years and, and, and what's generally used across the industry. Yeah, thank you for that one. Now, I've given ask when can the market expect the first results from the drilling at Tycoon 1? Uh, hopefully pretty soon. Yeah, we're, we're actually waiting for those results to come in ourselves. So we've been um, obviously jumping up and down on the lab as much as we can for speedy turnaround, but we're hoping to have some uh, results pretty quickly. Right, thank you for the update there. Just a couple more to finish us off with. Uh, what is the composition of oxide versus fresh materials in your feed? And does the feed composition change over the mine life? So uh, the sec second answer is yes, the feed composition does change. Um, probably best handled to look at, sorry, this image. So <clears throat> when we think about, um, when we think about the feed during the mine life, uh, obviously you mine from the surface down in an open pit setting. So when we think about the, this sort of T zone that you can see in this cross section here, that is oxide and transitional mineralization. So mineralization that's somewhere between being fresh, non-oxidized material and oxidized material. Yeah. Um, so this material is softer. Um, we've got about, about 280,000 ounces of our 1.5 million ounces in resource lies in this body of mineralization. Um, and then as you get down below that, you get down into the fresh material. So those fresh materials will be harder. Um, and about, it's about 25% of the mineralization mined is uh, oxide or, or transitional, uh, and the rest is fresh. Um, so hopefully that answers both of those questions um but you yeah you would expect to see these things go from harder into softer as as you as you go from open the open pit shallow to deep definitely does thank you for that one now just one more to finish off for his home uh Fishman would like you to comment on the recent share price weakness uh yeah okay uh look i think you know we're operating in the same market as everybody else. And, um, you know, I think we could all talk until the cows come home about the, the share prices for, for gold companies right now. I think, you know, in our, in the, in, in the case of us, one of the things we have to look at when we say recent share price weakness is its weakness relative to a 
pretty significant price spike that we had uh, a couple of months ago. And that followed uh, basically our share price going from 20 cents up to about 36 cents on the back of our resource upgrade. And what we saw uh, with the sustained uh, elevated gold price, both in US dollar and Australian terms, uh, there were a couple of weeks or probably two month period of time where we saw maybe what might've been a, a fairly described as a false start in the capital markets getting excited about gold again. But one of the great things plaguing gold companies uh, in our estimation has not been any negativity about gold, but a general lack of interest over the past few years. We saw uh, earlier this year, a moment where it looked like the market was really getting excited about gold again. We saw the very, very beginning of that. And we saw our share price go from 20 cents to 36 cents on quite substantial volume. So we were trading a million, two million, two and a half million shares in a day. That's now uh, retraced back on much, much, much lower volumes. We still have an expanding share register. So I just think we're in a situation where people are maybe a little bit disappointed in the market. It didn't, it didn't have this full breakout uh, market-wide or system-wide that everybody was hoping was finally going to be here. But we got a really good look at the type of energy that's available or will are sort of waiting behind our share price. Uh, we had several hundred new investors come into our, our registry during this period of time. So we feel really good about our strategy, which is to make sure that we are advancing and positioned to be on the front of this rising wave when we do get the sort of like the true real start and the you know, sort of the, the true return to interest in the sector. Well, it is positive to see increase in volumes. We just said no one coming in here. I uh, didn't ask why it's taken so long uh, to get the Tarkula drilling results. Uh, really just a function of actually getting all the materials out of field and getting them prioritized and getting through yeah. the lab. So we dropped quite a large volume on the lab. Uh, and in these labs, you know, we don't have the biggest labs uh, here where we are. So you're kind of always battling for space, but between the beginning and the end of the drilling program, uh, we kind of did it in three swings and we wanted to group all of the uh, results together so that we weren't uh, giving people really scattered drilling results for, across three different areas and, and, and doing it piecemeal. So we've grouped everything together. And so we be expecting to get these in, in um, uh, consolidated, rational, understandable chunks of results where we can show people the results for one area and another area and another area, as opposed to two holes and two holes and two holes and two holes from four different areas. Understandable. Thank you for that update there. Well, Alexander, that realistically wraps everything up. Before we close out, is there anything you'd like to leave the participants with? Uh, no, look, uh, just thank you, everybody, uh, everybody for joining us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to discuss. And as usual, you know, we are uh, very accessible. Uh, we have a lot of material on our website at all times. We're obviously uh, very communicative in terms of announcements. Uh, if you're interested, uh, sign up to our mailing list. We send out regular updates, and I do a sort of a month-end update. Uh, and also check out our media page. You can actually see aerial imagery of, of what this all looks like, so you can see how open accessible our terrain is and, and how developable our terrain is. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you out there. For those of you who are in Sydney later this month, please do come uh, have a chat with us at the Sydney Gold Conference, or the, so I should say the Australian Gold Conference at the uh, Crown Towers in Barangaroo at the 26th to, to the 28th of August. Well, Alexander, thank you very much for your time and expertise. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you much for your time. Uh, this one's been recorded. We'll be chucked up on the Sharewise YouTube channel, so feel free to rewatch or distribute as you may. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Cheers.